Hello and welcome to episode 238 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Vienna, Virginia. This is Ben Olson. With me is Nathan Fox in LA. I'm assuming you're lock, You're in lockdown. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere for a while, man. How about you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the plan. The kids were telling me yesterday that they want me to buy them a trampoline. <laughs> I thought you were going to say a switch. Yeah, well, we do have a switch already. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, I was—I mean, hey, that's cool. Get outside. That's great. So, aren't trampolines like the number one cause of backyard broken necks? Hmm. I—I I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to do a little bit of safety research before you go buying them the uh, backyard trampoline. I don't know. Hey, I'm all for you know them getting out and getting some exercise but uh yeah my understanding is that they they have some hazards yeah i think that they probably do Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah i'm not sure what to say about that i was thinking like i guess i could do my research on like driving right to like which which is more dangerous a trampoline or driving oh well i think we know the answer to that has got to be driving but you know anyway you've got you've got four (laughs) of those boys so if you lost one of them to a trampoline accident you know you'd still have three i'd still have three yeah i do say that to them every now and then i'm like you know back in the day people had extra for a reason <laughs> i mean i think that's actually true right for like farming and stuff They're yeah like well you're gonna lose one or two of these along the way to like <laughs> polio or something so you need enough farm hands you gotta have enough children but um yeah it sounds like you might be more concerned about the safety of my children than I am at this point. <laughs> Uncle Nate, Uncle Nate, he's coming to visit. He's going to check in on you and see. What <laughs> oh, I'm going to do a full safety inspection of that trampoline. Make sure that the, uh, you know, the safety netting that they put around the edge of it is all secure. Make sure it's, uh, it's got to be, I'm sure, on like flat level ground. Yeah, yeah. Check if all you, the footings. If you deny it, you're going to put up some red tape and all the kids are going to walk away with their heads down. Like, oh, oh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I so life is good though otherwise for you. Life's great, man. I'm uh I'm enjoying the quarantine really. Uh just other than moving all my classes online and just, you know, not seeing friends and stuff, uh life is much the same. I'm working from home, writing explanations for the demon, sending some emails, facetiming everybody, you know, call my get get the update from my grandma. Yeah. Uh <laughs> My grandma was so funny yesterday when I called her. She's like, you know, people don't understand me. I'm like, okay, grandma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she goes, I don't, people are asking me if, if I'm, if I'm sad about being shut up in my room here, but well, I don't even like to go for walks. <laughs> <laughs> She's <laughs> She's like just totally happy in her room reading like her trashy romance novels and oh, getting her funny. meals served to her. I've I've never understood the trashy romance novel. Yeah. I'm going to yeah, go out a, on a limb here and say that that those are read more frequently by the female half of the population. Is that sexist uh, <laughs> yes but um i, don't uh, but know. I, I mean, think i'm right yeah it's it's probably it's probably true i mean i don't know stereotypically true for sure um yeah my grandpa sure didn't read them but um yeah she's always read them she's always had them around like har- really like, literally yeah like literally harlequin romance novels like just read hundreds of them you know the one with the shirtless fabio on the cover on the cover yeah this totally makes me feel like like i'm going through the airport or something yeah and i look over and i see it's like what is that about (laughs) yeah she loves him man so yeah she's (laughs) she seems happy because it's like everybody's calling her to check on her and she doesn't have to do anything she doesn't want to do which she already doesn't do anything she doesn't want to do really but she's like well she's she's a little upset because they can't play cornhole anymore and Mm -hmm. they can't play shuffleboard and they can't do the puzzle so she's a little sad that all the group activities are canceled but as far as the meals um 
you know, they, they eat three meals a day and they, they have assigned seating. Like they sit with the same table of people huh. every day. Okay. I think yeah. it's because of like dementia in the old folks home, you know, they oh, want people sure. that have like a routine and try to remember people's names and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, so she doesn't, they, they canceled all those though. There, there are no more group meals even inside the old folks home. Like they're, hmm. she's like sequestered in her room yeah. inside the old folks home, which is already on lockdown for visitors and stuff. But uh, no, she seems like she's doing well. Um, my whole family's doing well. How about how about yours? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I think they're good. My dad is kind of um, he's a perpetual learner, right? Uh-huh. So yeah. he got his PhD in electrical engineering, and anyways, he's retired, but he still takes classes on like the latest physics yeah. stuff, you know. And it's yeah. kind of like what. I mean, cool. That's cool. So anyway, he's kind of put that mind to work on coronavirus. So every day I get an email update with some, you know, technical article on the latest estimates of the curve and all that stuff. He's certainly scouring the internet for the the latest and greatest. Um, yeah, it's been kind of helpful. But actually, this morning, an article I read from him said that some people are expecting that this could last as long as 18 months, given that yeah. we seem to be a little bit behind even Italy in terms of preparedness. So, geez, wow, yeah, that would be I interesting. Mean, yeah, cases and deaths are increasing at an increasing rate, and um, you know, it's like just potentially going to, if we don't keep the social distancing, there's the chance that it over over or certainty <laughs> that it overruns our healthcare system. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you don't have a hospital bed if you need one for emergency, whatever. And then you get all kinds of unnecessary deaths just because it's clogged. You know, the whole healthcare system is clogged up. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I've been reading that they could do the social distancing in like bursts mm. because you can ease that. Like if, if we get it under control and it's like, okay, you know, we're not overwhelming the healthcare system, then they can ease the social distancing a little bit. But the second they do, then the virus, you know, starts, it has another like wave of infections yeah. mm-hmm. and then they have to reinstitute the social distancing again. So what I'm reading is like they, they could sort of open schools, you know, for a, a month or something mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then immediately close them back down, almost hmm. like plan for it. Hmm. Um, well, I wonder if that's less effective than just being like, bite the bullet, keep it down. You know. Yeah the the problem is yeah the problem is the the longer you keep it down, then it looks like it's working, and so then the like will to keep doing it it goes away, right? Because sure. you're gonna get you're gonna have the naysayers, sort of like the anti vaxxers or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're gonna have people who are just saying. Oh well, this is bullshit. I mean, look, look at the results. We, I mean, we clearly don't need it <laughs> because if yeah. everything is, you know, kind of under control. Mm-hmm. Um, but the number of deaths worldwide is, I mean, we're gonna, it, <laughs> you're not going to be able to ignore what's going on in places like Italy, or any. Yeah, hopefully, um, we won't be worse than Italy. But um, if we are, that's uh, <laughs> a lot of deaths. Yeah. Well. Today on the show, we are going <laughs> to try to restore some normalcy by going back to our lovely pearls versus turds. We have a question about reading comp time per passage. Hmm, already sounds like a trap. We have a question about LSAT writing. Apparently, there is a smaller class at WF Law. WF? What's WF? Um, that's a good question. I think we'll find out. Okay, we will find out what WF Law is. Uh, Wake Forest, I just scanned down. Wake Forest. Okay, cool, Wake Forest Law. We have uh, some questions about 509 reports, which are the ABA required reports that law schools must submit yearly to the ABA and external scholarships. And we have questions about living stipends. I would add here, too, that I sent you an email with an article quoting uh, President Testi. That's the president of LSAC. Did you see that email? I read it. Yeah. I read the article. Yeah, I thought that some of her quotes would be worth sharing with the listeners online. Maybe we could start with that, actually. I mean, keep it topical. That is pretty topical. Okay, well, anyways, just so you know, if you have been living under a rock, the March LSAT was canceled, at least under a rock in the LSAT world. Of course, no one else cares or knows. Um, 
The else the June LSAT registration deadline is April twenty fourth. That is the day before the April LSAT, which I am putting my money on will be canceled or rescheduled to May. <laughs> That's my guess. That seems, yeah, seems almost without question. Yeah, they said they're going to announce two weeks before that test. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know that we we won't. They have said that they won't tell us for sure until April 10th or 11th, right? But, mm-hmm. um, or that they gave themselves that deadline. But yeah, it's, the way things are going, the way things are changing, it does seem very likely that they'll say no, April's canceled as well. Yeah. We have already mentioned this, but our April 25th, 26th class that we were going to do in New York City is now going to be online from 1 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, That's 10 to 2 Pacific time. So no matter where you are in the world, join us. Two days, right? Two days, yep. Mm -hmm. 1 to 5. 5 and 26. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1 to 5. And you said we have a little uptick of registration since uh, we announced that we were doing it online. Yeah, um, quite a bit, actually. So people seem to be uh, open to this idea in the new world that we live in, and uh, we're excited to be teaching together yet again. As part of this class, you'll get access to our two previous, or two of our previous um, joint classes, one from Vegas, I think, and another one from New York. Anyway, so I would suggest signing up watching those classes, getting as much out of them as you can, and then joining us uh, online on the 25th and 26th. Okay. Yeah, the June yeah. sets on June 8th, Monday, if it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can always email the show at help at com. Please send us your selfies. We like to include those in the social media posts. I think people haven't been doing that as much lately. Just got to get out there and share your face with the world. All right, should we jump into this? these quotes from President Testi? Yeah, yeah. It's an above-the-law article. We'll link to it in the show notes. The headline is called, The LSAT is the latest victim of COVID-19. The subhead is, Because applying to law school wasn't stressful enough. Um, this came out yesterday. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, Leave it to law school applicants to be like, fml even more you know it's like oh (laughs) i don't know it's so funny like the coronavirus is such a big deal that i'm kind of happy that everybody has shut up about basically everything else you know yeah i'm very happy to not be hearing about the election all the time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah it's just funny like law school applicants letting the anxiety from coronavirus also bleed into their anxiety if anything this should illustrate how like non-important law school is in the grand scheme of things Mm. you know it's like one thing that i'm taking away from the whole coronavirus experience is just how unimportant most of what we do every day really is all those Mm -hmm. gatherings Mm -hmm. and parties and multiple different stops you have to make at every single store every time you leave the house you know, you got to go mm-hmm. 10 different places and buy 10 different things and do a million different things and always have your calendar jammed with parties and restaurants and bars and just <laughs> like, it's like so unnecessary to actual living, you know, I don't know. It just yeah. gives you some perspective on your, you almost wonder if it's a distraction from living. Yeah, exactly. You said you were like yeah. spending more quality time with your kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been talking to my family more. I've been, you know, doing more of the things that seem like they're important. So the whole law yeah. school thing. I mean, have some perspective. I, that, that's just it's just the subhead like already is grating on me because applying yeah. to law school wasn't stressful enough. Oh, it's so hard. Period. <laughs> yeah. Period. Period. It's just like, <laughs> hey, we're in the middle of a fucking outbreak. Like what? <laughs> I don't know. Stop taking yourself so seriously. And then whoever decided to illustrate this article decided to include (laughs) a Scantron, which is a picture of a Scantron. Yeah. (laughs) With what is that? A stethoscope stethoscope. or something? That is a weird combination of things. Um, (laughs) Okay. Anyways, (laughs) I shared this article with you because I was curious what LSAC president Kelly Testy had to say. 
And, you know, she's just like, she's constantly spinning whatever they do in a positive light, which is her job, yep. I suspect. But uh, her first quote here is telling us how applicants reacted to their decision to cancel the March LSAT. They not only expected it, she says, it was met with great relief. I suspect that a lot of people were happy that they canceled, but yeah. I also suspect that there were a lot of people who were very unhappy. So <laughs> I just feel like this is a Trumpian thing. Like, no matter what happens, I'm going to tell you it was great. Yeah. She also might just be trying to do the right thing, spreading the word about social distancing, right? Yeah, which is fine. I just, <laughs> I don't know. I just don't believe <laughs> much of what comes out of people's mouths. She's not, days, especially yeah, she's, from leadership. she's totally ignoring the, like, I'm sure a lot of people were like, what the fuck do you mean? The can't, la- I have to <laughs> apply to law school this week. <laughs> we have another email later yeah. on the agenda of somebody freaking out because they waited to the last minute to do one of the components of their law school application. So, I mean, the reality at the LSAC, as soon as they canceled that test, they must have had so many people flipping out. Yeah. She continues, oh, this is continuing to explain why uh, it's not a big deal. Thankfully, we're pretty far along in the current admission cycle. Most schools already had deadlines or have them in early April. Most students are already tested and are maybe finishing up applications. There's not many who are really in need of that score in order to apply. Well, again, I, I think there are a lot of people who want it to apply now, but they shouldn't. Um, and that's really... True. Yeah, she'd never say that though. Like everybody who's in that business yeah. is like, oh well, there are still apply, plenty apply. of schools that have availability. You know, schools are. Hey, we saw schools sending out emails like, we will accept the April LSAT. You know, we see that every year. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now this is where it gets a little more interesting because um, she acknowledges that they are looking at other ways of administering the test. And we talked about this just on the, the bonus episode we did about the, the virus. But um, she writes, Testy noted that the writing portion of the LSAT is currently administered remotely. Yes, okay, that's the writing sample, LSAT writing, as it's called these days. You are sitting in your home, and there is a software system that allows you to take the test from your own computer. This is from Testy. The idea is that you can take it remotely and it would be secure. So the implication there, I think, is clearly that the LSAT could be administered the same way. I'm not sure how practical that is, because, boy, you'd have to have a lot of proctors. But I guess you could have one proctor watching multiple people. This is assuming, of course, that they take it at the same time. But I think that they kind of do want people to take it at the same time, so there's less likelihood of sharing, you know, tips. Yeah. The second they start offering the same test at different times, it's too high stakes. So there would be yeah. rampant cheating. <laughs> Which is why they need to go to computer adaptive, right? Then you're not getting the same questions as other people. Right. Even and, then, and less likely. If people were able to take it at home with computer adaptive, they'd have no way of keeping those questions private. Because they can't monitor the whole yeah. room, right? If nothing else, you could just have a one of those teddy bear spy cams in your background. Yeah. Or any yep. kind of camera mm-hmm. on your screen. Oh, great, Nathan. You're just giving everyone the this idea now. So it's out of the <laughs> yeah. bag. But yeah, people would have figured this out. I mean, that's just too easy. Yeah. So they wouldn't... Yeah, they'd have no way of keeping the questions under wraps for very long. But the way they do it now, they don't have to worry about... I mean, they'd still try to stop piracy, but... They don't have to worry about people really cheating because everybody's yeah. taking the test at the same time. What about these Sullivan Learning Centers? Sullivan, uh, I think. Sullivan? Oh, sorry. Um, in this day and age with the virus. I mean, I don't, I don't see why that still couldn't be a good option. Yeah, they, you just go they don't sit you cubicle. right next to somebody. You know, they, they keep their spacing in between those terminals. They'd have to obviously, mm-hmm. like, thoroughly bleach everything in between applicants or whatever but yeah. uh yeah i don't see why that shouldn't that seems like a perfectly reasonable way to securely administer the tests yeah i don't know that there's capacity in those testing centers though to do 
everybody at the same time. No, but I don't think they would have to. Again, if they went to computer adaptive and you were yeah, in one of those right. testing centers, your chances of like cheating, because they take your phone, I'm yeah, pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, you can't bring so, any of that stuff in with you. I mean, I suppose you could still have the spy goggles, you know, the glasses with the built-in camera or something like that. <laughs> it's real hard to stop it just people becomes these days from doing that kind of thing, right? Yeah. You could have a little mini mm-hmm. pin cam, pinhole, whatever camera on you all the time. It wouldn't be that hard. Yeah. But who knows? Hmm. We'll we'll see. We'll see how fast they adapt. Yeah. Well, anyways, yeah. You want to tackle this first one? This pearl versus turd. Sure. The subject of the email is augmented writing, pearl or turd. Greetings. What are your thoughts on augmented writing? Do either of you use any platforms to help your writing? Grammarly, Boomerang, WordRake, etc. Please let me know. Thanks anonymous so the the per, the tip i guess the pearl the pearl v turd tip is uh augmented writing is a good thing i i think so i i think that people huh, they can use augmented writing in at least one of two ways one is you run your writing through grammarly or word rake or whatever and you see what happens right and then you look at the suggestions and you read the sentence out loud to yourself and you consider the change and whether it's better or maybe even something else that the tool didn't come up with, you come up with to kind of resolve whatever the tool was trying to resolve but maybe didn't do so successfully. And then you incorporate those ideas into your writing and your writing becomes better and you learn from your mistakes. And then there are people who just put it into Grammarly and whatever Grammarly tells them, they make that change blindly (laughs) without thinking about it. And I think that's bad. I would rather people look at it as like um, an AI tutor that's trying to help you get better at writing and maybe make you aware of some potential problems. If you use it in that way, I think they're excellent. I mean, they're extraordinarily cheap for what you could be getting. Like if you actually tried to pay attention and learn from what they're trying to tell you. Yeah. It's funny. That reminds me of sometimes people in our personal statement service, we, we, you know, make all these comments and make all these suggested edits for them. And every once in a while we have a client who you can tell, they just like go in there and just accept all. Like they're not, yeah. we, we write, yeah, we, we show you the edits on purpose because we want to, <laughs> while you're paying us thousands of dollars to help you with this document, you might as well like get some feedback on your writing, right? Get, a, become a better yeah. writer as a result of this process, hopefully. But some people, when they yeah. just hit the like accept all button, it's just like, okay, I'm ready for you guys to do another round of edits. And it's like, it's like you what'd you do? All you did is, yeah, <laughs> it's like, especially you have like two like periods in one space or something. You're like, okay, I don't think you read this. You just let the tool accept all. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's a shame because you're not learning anything. You've mentioned Grammarly on the show though, a million times. I mean, we, we do advise our clients to use Grammarly before they even send stuff to us, but yeah, it's not yeah. perfect. And I mean, it's not going to like make you, there's places where it, it potentially might make you sound like a robot. And so, yeah, you don't want to not have a voice and you don't want to just be a shitty writer because you only rely on these tools. By the way, I should, I I do want to take a moment here to pitch something from my old boss. So I used to work for Ross Guberman who helps lawyers write better And, you know, I did legal writing consulting for several years with him. And, I mean, he's amazing. He does, like, he's helping attorneys at pretty much any and every firm you've ever heard of. And he came up with this tool called Brief Catch. And it's the same idea as Grammarly and WordRake, but it's, it's geared for attorneys. And in talking to him, he, you know, he's excited about it. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a, a writing nerd to the extreme, right? And so uh, he was telling me that while these tools have, I don't know, you know, 2,000, 3,000 different like algorithms that they're running on each sentence to find potential things that could be rewritten, he's got something like 10,000, 15,000. I mean, 
the guy is always just thinking about this stuff and saying, oh, well, this, this here's another iteration of this construction of words that should be really written this way. Anyways, so his tool is Brief Catch, and it is geared toward lawyers. So if you go to law school, if you decide to continue on this journey, I would suggest looking that up. It's an add-on to Microsoft Word, but yeah, if you're serious about writing and you're serious about law, that's a tool I would use, and I would use it to learn about how to become a better writer. Because, yeah, it's cool that it catches stuff and tells you what to do, but like you should really think about that for a second, because someone who really knows writing thought about that construction of words and said, okay, I want that to be flagged and this alternative suggestion to be made. Cool. So, Yeah, um, I think augmented writing seems like a pearl. Yeah, uh, if you use it right, yeah. that's the caveat. We use it all the time in smaller ways too, right? I mean, spell check is augmented writing. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, yep. I do most of my writing in Gmail, weirdly, um, which doesn't actually do much of that stuff, or I haven't figured out how to make mm. the, the spell check and grammar check stuff work very well in Gmail. But when I do yeah. write in um, like Google Docs is better. And, and yeah, you, you learn from it. You're, it's, it makes mm-hmm. a suggestion. Oh, this should be two, not four or whatever. And it's like, oh, yeah. really? Huh? Let me think about that. Look it up and yeah. look up definitions of words. That's a form of augmented writing too. I'm amazed. I think I look up words way more often now than I ever did before in my life. It's like a <laughs> humility, it, or you know, it's 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 a combination yeah. of humility slash ego. Like where now I expect to know what it means. And so if someone uses a word mm-hmm. and I, it doesn't sound right, I'm like, oh, well, but let me look up the def- Let me look it up. And then I can see, you know, why yeah. is that not right? Or maybe I'm wrong and maybe it is right. You know, it's funny. It's kind of, it makes me feel how I do in like social situations. I mean, I don't know why I'm thinking of parties right now, but there was a time in my life when I feel like I would be at some event <laughs> And someone would say something and I would have no fucking clue what they're talking about. And I would just smile and be like, yeah, oh yeah. Oh and yeah. At this point, you know, it's like people say things and I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> but what's funny is that that's, you know, a lot of times it is more esoteric than I thought. There's a reason like, I don't know what you're talking about. And sometimes people are like, what? You don't know that? And I'm like, yeah, sorry, I don't. But cool, I'm glad. That's interesting. Glad glad you're so familiar with that. Um, and now I'm enlightened, and I know something that I didn't know five minutes ago, and I wouldn't have known if I had continued this awkward, ha <laughs> ha, yeah, cool. That's really similar to of. how our best students always ask the most questions. Like the top scoring students are, are quickest mm-hmm. to say they don't understand something right yeah the, yeah the mm-hmm. masses are just sort of like nodding along you know they it's easy for them to just kind of go to sleep and not admit it when they don't understand something but the top students mm-hmm. are like no i'm expecting to understand this i don't understand it then i want to understand it so tell me what's going on with this and then you can actually like yeah. help that person so it's human nature i don't know maybe little kids you just kind of get because little kids are so dumb right like they know nothing they have no experience, mm-hmm. no education. They're just dumb little humans. And which is, you know, everybody starts off that way, but they have to sort of fake their way through life, right? You don't, it's not until you're an adult that you realize that everyone has just been bullshitting the whole time. Well, I wonder too, yeah. <laughs> I wonder too, like, it seems like how much of that curiosity or that, that desire to ask questions gets beaten out of them, right? Like, they're, they don't know. So they're like, wait, why? What's that? I mean, my kids ask me stuff like that all the time. I'm like, what what are you talking about there? And then, you know, sometimes my responses are good and I answer. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, like, I don't have time Not for right this. Now. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure you just do the job. You've raised some, <laughs> some smart, curious little kids. I mean, they're, they're expecting to understand for sure. But even them, you know, they'll have like high school kids, for example, just think mm-hmm. they know everything, right? They've yeah. just got it all sorted out. When, once you're like a senior in high school, then you're just like hot <laughs> shit, you know? Yeah. You're, you're an adult now. You just, you got it. You know everything. And then you get to college and realize you didn't know shit. 
And then same yeah. thing, same thing happens when you get closer to graduating college. I think people think they know what's up and then get a little older and you realize, Oh boy, I had no idea what was going on this entire time. Yeah. Maybe we continue doing that. All right. Well, that's a pearl. The scoreboard, seven pearls now, 29 turds, 14 ties. Cool. Thanks, Anonymous. I wish you would have given us your name. We could have given you props. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next one is RC time per passage. The question says, how much time should I be spending on each passage versus the questions in RC? What if I have time and a half? Why? Wait, what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, sorry, I was thrown off by that last question. Uh, you know, we, I mean, I think I can speak for you. I'm happy for you to jump in, of course, and tell me your thoughts. But we don't have a specific time for the passage and the questions. But I will say that I generally spend about 40, 50% of the time reading the passage and 50 to 60% of the time answering the questions. I think for a lot of people when they're starting out, they're spending like closer to 10 to 20% of the time reading the passage and 80 to 90% of the time answering the questions. Yeah. And to me, that's not an efficient uh, allocation of time. So I guess I wouldn't worry so much about how much time. I would just say, think about spending more reading so that you can go faster through the questions. Yeah, you... And specifically to go faster through the wrong answer choices. The, mm -hmm. there's, a, yeah. there's a huge bulk of words locked up in those wrong answer choices, and you really only need to find the right one. So if mm -hmm. you read the passage better, then once you get to the questions, the wrong answers are going to look way worse. Mm -hmm. The thing about the wrong answers is that they have all the right words, but in the complete wrong order it just doesn't they don't make sense it's not it's not making sense it's not answering the question basically but it is using all the same words from the passage and so mm -hmm. if you didn't really grasp the meaning of the passage then the answer choices are going to the wrong answers are going to look really attractive because oh i they were talking about that oh yeah i remember they read they that word was there but it's like mm -hmm. oh, you didn't get the meaning though you didn't you didn't get the main point and really the purpose of the passage and so now the wrong answers yeah. just, I mean, they mean something. They just don't mean the same thing as what the passage meant. And because you don't understand what the passage meant, now you're taking forever to go through these wrong answer choices. Yeah. If you ever feel like you're picking an answer, that's a really good point, by the way. If you ever feel like you're picking an answer because you remember those words being mentioned, <laughs> yeah. you're in most likely yeah. deep shit. Because the wrong answers are filled with words from the passage rearranged in strange yeah. ways. Yep. And the right answer can totally just use synonyms, you know, like words that weren't mm -hmm. necessarily even mentioned in the passage, but have the exact same meaning. And yeah. so you've really got to have a good handle on if, if you read the passage well enough, then you should be able to predict the answers to like half the questions on the reading comp maybe even more yeah. than half the questions. Mm -hmm. And once, if you can, yeah. if you feel like, oh, I know what the answer should be to this question, then the wrong answers just look like trash. It's just like, huh? You read that, you read a, what? What is that even about? Huh? Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. And you know, you, cause you can almost start yeah. laughing cause you see how the test writers yep. took words from the passage and put, yep. put them together. And then, and then the right answer should just, you know, if it matches your prediction, great. Or if it's parallel, similar to your prediction, great. And you feel you start feeling good about those right answers, and you feel worse about the wrong answers, and then you get to go through the questions really quickly. I think fifty-fifty yeah. might be a you know a good rule of thumb. Half the time on the passage, half the time on the questions. Should that? I don't think that should change if you have time and a half. No, no, I don't see why that would change at all. It's a percentage, right? So yeah, everybody reads at a different speed. So sure. So if you have extra time. Um, I would just, you know, maybe double down even more on everybody should just take all the time that you need to read the passage. You really got to be able to get that. You, you got to tell me what that passage is about. You got to understand what they wanted, like why they wrote that passage. If you can do that, yeah. then the questions just shouldn't be that hard. So if that's not how it feels for you now, I would experiment with trying more time while you're reading the passage. 
and and tuning in to when you don't understand something. Kind of like at that party. Like when you don't understand what the person is talking about, say, I'm sorry, what? And, you know, you can't talk to the author of the passage, but you can reread the sentence that you just read. You can read half of it again, or the first half, or the last half, or the, or the clause that seems to be befuddling you, and sit on it for a half second. There are times when I'm reading Reading Comp, and I will read a sentence, and I go, huh? And then I'll read it again, and I'll go, hmm, I'm still perplexed, but they could mean A or they could mean B. And then when I read the next sentence, I'm like, oh, they must have meant A. Like, the fact that I took a, t- a second to like think about the potential interpretation, and I still didn't know which one was correct, when I kept reading, I was like, oh, they obviously meant interpretation A, and now I understand, as opposed to just kind of continuing in this cloud of, I don't know, confusion. Sounds good. Yep. I'll start writing. Oh, by the way, that was L. Thanks, L, for writing in. You want to read this? Yeah. Uh, LSAT writing. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I'm a previous customer of LSAT Demon, and I loved the system. I was going to take my writing portion of the test today, as I have an application that goes out tomorrow, parentheses, nothing like waiting until the last minute, exclamation point. Unfortunately, I opened the writing sample test in Safari, which unbeknownst to me does not support the software for the test. I then opened LSAC in Chrome and in it indicated that the test was initiated and I was unable to access it because he tried to do it in Safari apparently and then switched over to Chrome. That's my guess. Hmm. So they said, no, you already have a test in progress. (laughs) Of course, don't try to cheat yeah. on the right LSAT yeah. writing. Of course, it's a Saturday, and it's past business hours for LSAC, parentheses, ridiculous, as I assume most JD candidates do their work on the weekends. I was hoping you guys might have some advice. Thanks, George. Well, I imagine that our advice is coming to you much later than any advice you got on Monday <laughs> from LSAC. But... Do you need to have the writing portion done to apply? Um, yeah, lots of times you do. They, I thought, well, you do. I guess they. I thought that they had changed that. I yeah. thought they had too. So, I thought there well, was something. Where so maybe yeah, systematically, anyway. like programmatically, George is able to apply without that writing sample. So that might be a good, good test, good tip. But yeah. I thought that they were potentially. I mean, I could see schools being like, we're not evaluating your application until we have that. Yeah. 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 It's a bummer. I mean, we can use this as a PSA that if you're, Mm -hmm. that that they have had lots of problems with LSAT writing online. Many, many people have had problems with the software. So, you know, it's a task that you need to get done before you can go to law school. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't yeah. take very long. It's it's not a task that's going to take you more than you know an hour. You could prep mm-hmm. for it and do it in an hour. <laughs> I mean, watch two of our videos about it and then do it. Right? Mm-hmm. We got videos in the demon about the writing sample. Yeah. Or LSAT writing. So watch the video. Go to LSAC.org and you know wade through their software problems and get the writing sample or the LSAT writing done sooner rather than later. Because, you know, George, if uh, your school was demanding that, you know, if they, if they're waiting to evaluate your application until they have this writing sample, there's just nothing you can do about it. Yeah. But I mean, the broader advice to George is like, or to the listeners is don't be like George. I mean, (laughs) why are you applying so late? And why are you waiting till the last minute with this, with the, with one of these components? <laughs> it's just not, this is not like lawyer behavior. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing. I, I guess I don't understand why you can't do it on Monday. Like, is it, is your application due Saturday or Sunday? Like, and it's over unless you have it all. 
I, I, I guess if um, he's saying he clubs. has an application that goes out tomorrow, my guess is that that the that was the deadline. Otherwise, yeah. why does Sunday? <laughs> otherwise, why does the application have to go out tomorrow? What? Where is that an arbitrary deadline that he set for himself? Yeah. So then it does come down to can you apply without it? So I mean. I would have, if I was stuck in that situation, applied anyways, unless the system right. doesn't let you just apply and then on Monday get it done. And then pff, probably no one's going to be the wiser because by the time they look at your application, it'll be I think it. it's totally possible so. that schools have the box checked, though. I mean, I don't know how their, their you know, back end of this whole thing works, but I think some schools might just have the box checked like we don't want to get applications that are incomplete. Like just don't send, you know, LSAC. Yeah go ahead and hold that application until it's complete or just, we don't want to yeah. be bogged down with incomplete applications. I could see some schools making that decision. I mean, the other thing here, well, you probably shouldn't be applying at the last day of the application no. anyway, but um, <laughs> again, you can always ask, get it done. And then on Monday, call the school and say, Hey, I missed your deadline, but um, I had a technical problem. <laughs> You see what they say. They may say, sorry, you should have had your shit together before you did that. But look, these schools are looking for applicants. I don't see why they wouldn't just say, oh, you have all your stuff done now. You don't talk to them with your writing sample still incomplete, right? That would be ridiculous. But I will get it done, I promise, in the next day or two. You get it done and you just say, okay, hey, look, I have everything ready. Can I just submit it to you now and see what they say? Yeah, good luck, George. Um, Everybody else, just take care of business way before these deadlines you need to you're just if if the word deadline is even in your head you're just not doing it right you should be applying way way before all these deadlines if you care about going to the best law school you can get into and if you care about getting scholarship money there's there's no way you should you shouldn't even know what the application deadline is for these schools you should be thinking about when the applications open not when they close yeah yeah excellent okay all right, so this is um, hmm. okay. This is the email about smaller class, smaller class yeah. at Wake yeah, Forest. This is interesting. Law. Okay, so dear, dear redacted, an update. The subject line is an update from Wake Forest Law. We wanted to share some important news about our entering JD class this fall. We have decided to take a bold step with our incoming JD class. Instead of creating our traditional class of one hundred and sixty. Students, we will admit an elite class of 90 first year JD hmm. students. Now I have to look at their 509. I'm evaluating <laughs> one claim they just made. Do you want to know which? Do you want to guess which claim I'm evaluating? Whether or not they traditionally have 160? Nope. There's just one word. You could reread that sentence maybe if you want to know what I'm questioning sure okay instead of creating our traditional class of 160 we will admit an elite class of 90 first year yeah, JD there's students. one word there that you would not allow someone to put in their personal statement well elite that's for a, sure that's what i'm evaluating <laughs> so this is a good yeah well this given that's subjective i was like okay well elite for their standard exactly but yeah what's so their uh, <laughs> now i'm looking for evidence to support elite so i'm looking at their 509 and i'm I'm uh their their twenty fifth percentile is one sixty three, their seventy fifth percentile is one sixty eight. Hmm. I mean, that's strong compared to lots of other law schools. I, I didn't. Yeah. Oh wait, my bad. Somehow when I clicked the Wake Forest, <laughs> that was Georgetown's five hundred nine. Hold on a second. <laughs> You're like yes, top fourteen numbers here. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> Hold on. What? How did that happen? That's so weird. I just clicked the wrong thing in the Google. Okay. Wake now. Forest in Georgetown? They're Wake like not Forest. Even close. Um, Wake Forest's 25th percentile is 156. And their mm. 75th is 163. And okay. that seriously undermines their claim of admitting any kind of elite class. Now, if they cut it down from 160 to, to 90... They should be able to bump those numbers up a bit, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, they'll be in the one sixty to one sixty three range or something like that, maybe. But you know, one sixty to one sixty three—that's what the eightieth percentile, roughly. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So 80th. if mm-hmm. if by elite we mean 80th percentile, um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> the writing tip here is don't put shit like that in your writing because you just, it has the exact opposite of the intended effect. Like mm-hmm. you thought, you know, they thought what they were impressing us, but instead we see that and we just skeptically go, eh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Let me see. Well, it's interesting. It's, um, <laughs> it may have the intended effect on a certain set of non elite right? readers. And then it, <laughs> on the non-elite <laughs> readers. Yeah, I mean, it's worked for Trump, right? Oh, yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, people love hearing, oh, everything's great, the call was perfect. Um, <laughs> What did he say? Did you see him saying at the CDC that uh, the test administration of the coronavirus was perfect, just like his call was perfect? He made the comparison between the He's two? He's just such a doofus he's just a clown right he's just like making a joke out of everything (laughs) you can see the people standing next to him like trying to smile and look like they're supposed to be (laughs) looking and also squirming like once like a statesman (laughs) like act like you're taking this seriously for once (laughs) anyway So this continues, Wake Forest law has long been intentional about the size of our entering duty classes, and this decision bolsters our (laughs) tradition. Oh, please. You're you're following a long history of seeking the elite class. That's like saying you're bucking the trend when you're continuing the trend. This is a a, a a fake-manism coming out of Wake Forest here. We've long been intentional about the size of our classes. That's why we're cutting down from 160 to 90. (laughs) What are you talking about? You're admitting that your class last year was too big, and it hurts the reputation of your school. We should be real clear about this, Ben. When your school admits more students, they devalue Mm -hmm. your degree. You want your school to admit fewer students because it makes the value of your degree in the marketplace greater. There's less of you, less people with that degree. So the people who went to Hastings in the 80s when the classes were, you know, a lot smaller, they got their degree devalued by Hastings admitting so many people in the 2000s. And that's just very obvious. So what you're doing here, Wake Forest, is you're trying to boost the value of your degree by having a more sensible class size. But yeah, claiming that you have long been intentional about the size of your class while cutting it almost in half (laughs) just makes no sense. (laughs) That's funny. Might be better. Well, we'll see. Hey, so I got some kids here, and uh, I think you mentioned earlier that um they would ask for the switch yeah is that that what you said asking if they can use the switch yeah jed what's your question can i play switch (laughs) you can put jed on the mic what are you gonna play fortnite no maybe yes Yes. yeah all right (laughs) all right now there's gonna be a whole like let's see someone else is gonna Um, come ask you for something else yeah, everybody else says, oh, well, if he gets to do this, then I get to do blah, blah, blah. Holy cow. Buy a trampoline? Buy a trampoline. That's right. I'm going to do that today, actually. Oh, wait. I have to get your safety approval. Um, we'll talk okay. after the show, I guess. But anyways, I just gave them time. So hopefully that will buy us some time. Uh, back to this. I mean, Yeah. Let's continue reading. Yeah, yeah. Following two larger than expected entering classes. Okay. This step will ensure that the total number of JD students is consistent with our goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We believe in the tight bond between students and professors, classmates, and the community. These deep connections emphasize human skills, build on important values, and create a holistic perspective of the law. Oh, geez. These people are really, like enthralled with their own writing. We know our focus on developing empathy, judgment, creativity, and perseverance. Perseverance, okay? In citizen lawyers through legal education flourishes in our intimate setting. 
Oh, really? They just, I mean, that first sentence that you just read, following two larger than expected entering classes, like it's like it was a surprise to them. Maybe it was because they have to admit so many more people than actually matriculate. Right. So that's Mm. what happened is they got more people told them yes than they were expecting. Let's be honest, dude. But were they they crying made about 858 that? I mean, offers of admission last year and only 215 people enrolled. So yeah. their yield is less than one fourth. So yeah, I guess they were taken by surprise that so Wait, many people told them up. yes. So their class last year was 212? Uh, 215 enrollees is what it says in the 2019. So... I guess traditionally they were 160. Last two years it's been over 200. And now they're going down to 90. Maybe 160 was their goal. Oh, yeah, the traditional class of 160. That doesn't say last year. Oh, so yeah. now they're cutting that down to 90 because last year they admitted two, two, yeah, 215 out of 858. So I guess they did get taken by surprise. Like, oh, shit, we didn't think. Like, we knew we were going to have to admit a lot of people in order to get people at our school. But we got surprised that too many people said yes. So now they're cutting it way down. And they're, they're, but they're making a big deal out of this, right? They're like trying to, trying to pimp themselves by saying how competitive it's going to be now. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Hmm. No, no, okay. This one-time adjustment gives all our JD students more access to resources at the School of Law, capitalized. This decision has impacted the number of decisions that have been released. Huh? This decision has impacted the number of decisions <laughs> yeah. that have been released, yeah. as well as the timing of our decision they releases. They need an edit on that, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <laughs> they have. Uh, it's affected how many decisions they've sent out to. You could tell they stumbled over double that space. sentence, yeah, because they're. That's awesome that you caught the double space. It's like, yep, you've been using one period, one space between periods, until you got to that sentence which you was tortured clearly in the note <laughs> and rewrote yeah. like six times. Yeah. Someone's like, no, 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 that's not technically accurate. And it's weird. It's, it's oddly phrased in the passive, right? This decision has impacted the number of decisions. Instead of saying that we have, have released. delayed releasing our decisions. Yeah. Like what are they? So like walking on ice here um, or eggshells. It's or funny. The, it's understand. impacted the number that have been released and the timing of the releases. Well, what's the difference between those two? You could have just said yeah. this changes the timing of the decision releases. This is slowed down yeah. our process. <laughs> We're thinking more about yeah, no who we're going to accept. I mean, why are they so embarrassed about that? I don't understand. I don't so double space, then it says, we understand that delays in processing may be somewhat frustrating and ask for your continued patience as we navigate this cycle, releasing decisions as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Look, if they're really reducing their class to 90 folks, then they're in the driver's seat, right? All of a yeah. sudden, like they, they can, like people can say, fuck you to them and they can say, fine, fuck you back because we don't, it's easy for us to fill 90 we did 215 last year. I I don't understand why they're so like antsy. Anyways, they could have spun it much more positively. They could have they could have kept it way way shorter. Way shorter. And they could have just said, "We've decided this year to strengthen our school or whatever by mm-hmm. reducing the number of admitted admitted applicants down to 90." This means that you're not going to be getting a decision anytime soon, but it also means that if you get in, you're going to be getting in with a bunch, you know, with a, with a pimp in class or whatever. Yeah. I mean, they could <laughs> and just been like, thanks, I'm out. Yeah. But they buried it. Yeah, if you're st- <laughs> they buried it. They say in the last paragraph, if your intentions or interests in Wake Forest Law have changed, please reach out to me or our admissions team at lawadmissions at wfu.edu or their phone number. We will continue to review applications and render, render decisions throughout the remainder of the cycle and appreciate your continued interest in Wake Forest Law. Sincerely, 
blah, blah. Yeah, the TLDR on that is we're worried about our U.S. news ranking. We've decided to shrink our class. And also, by the way, yield is really important. So if you've applied but you've decided to change your mind, please tell us right now so that we can Mm -hmm. get you to withdraw your application you know, so that we don't accidentally admit you and then get den- and then have you deny us. Yeah. <laughs> we want, we want to know that you're not going to come here so that we, our yield will go up. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you for sending that in. Whoever sent that in. Um, 509s. 509s and external scholarships. ABA 509 reports also list external scholarships and fellowships. Question mark? Oh, that's the subject. Hi there. I am working on negotiating scholarships and would prefer to keep my name anonymous. I have a question for the podcast. Under the grants scholarships section of the ABA ABA 509 reports, are fellowships or scholarships from external funding sources also reported? I understood that the scholarship amounts reported in the 509 were from funds coming directly from the school's admission office, but maybe I am mistaken. Thank you. And apparently we got several emails asking the same question. Hmm. Interesting. I did brief research. I, my gut said that the 509 is only listing school money. I would agree. My understanding is that the vast majority of dollars that are available come straight from the school. Because mm-hmm. the thing is, it's not actual dollars coming from anyone. Yeah. It's just the school saying, oh, we're going to pretend we're going to give you a fake $40,000 a year scholarship, which means that mm-hmm. the tuition for you is going to be $15,000 instead of $55,000. That's the game that's really being played. So they have unlimited monopoly money. They'll Mm -hmm. pretend, oh, we have limited funds, blah, blah, blah. No, the truth is you want maximum revenue. So you're not giving, if you're not giving a scholarship, it's because you want more profit. It's because you want more revenue coming in. Yeah. And so the, the bulk of those dollars, it's so easy for them to just print unlimited of those scholarships if they want to. So mm-hmm. yeah, the the bulk mm-hmm. of the money, I, I can't imagine how would they include all external grants and scholarships? Like you'd have to get it and then report it to the school. I suppose that's possible. I mean, you do have to fill out like a FAFSA. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. The brief research that I did, it, it seemed like from the blog posts I was reading, it just seemed like that that's, that's money that comes from the school. The schools love to talk about how there is additional money out there from other sources when they don't Mm -hmm. give you a scholarship, but I don't think they're actually, they're not, they're not saying, Oh no, there's extra money besides what was on the ABA. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, I suppose they could be claiming that, Oh no, those full rides. No, we don't give full rides. Those full rides on the ABA 509 must've come from external sources. I don't know, but I've, I've never heard any school doing that. So no, I don't think so. Yeah. If anybody knows better than us, cause we obviously don't know, please email the show help at thinking com. Set us straight on this, but for now, I think we can just say no on that five hundred nine. That's that's money that comes straight from the school, and don't let them give you that bullshit about oh no, you should just enroll and then there's there's lots of money available from out, outside scholarships that you can apply to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's like so many agreements in life where the person just says, "Trust me." I'm good for the money. Really? (laughs) Yeah. Anyways. Cool. Well, this next one, thanks, by the way, for asking. That sounds like it's a common question. Living stipends. Okay. So, hi, Ben and Nathan. Do you have any advice about how to get a full tuition scholarship that also covers living costs? I don't want to pay for law school, but it seems that many law schools that give full rides don't cover living expenses like rent, food, and transportation. For example, if I got a full tuition scholarship to UCLA, I would still have to take out $75,000 in loans to cover living expenses. How do I truly go to law school for free? Thanks. S. Um, That's the type of question we like. That is the type of question we like. I mean, well, for one, you could look at the 509 reports that we were just talking about and see how many scholarships they gave that were more than full because if the answer to that is zero then that school is unlikely to bend for yeah you. unless they change their policy this year which is all they could which is possible mm-hmm. but yeah but less likely right yeah. so the more 
students that are getting more than full tuition scholarships at that school um, increases your likelihood of asking and getting, assuming that you, you know, are in the top 75th percentile for both LSAT and GPA. Yeah, you can always ask. I mean, if you know that you're a kick-ass candidate for, for that school, you can always just say, hey, thanks for the full ride offer, but uh, I noticed that some other schools are giving living stipends. We see this all the time, right? We've, we've seen people turn down Harvard to go to Michigan with a $10,000 a year stipend. We mm-hmm. think we've heard of stipends mm-hmm. of $15,000 a year before. And yeah. so, you know, I would say apply broadly. That's the best advice, maybe. Apply early, broadly. Yeah, probably broad, broadly, because you don't know who's going to be excited to give you money and who is not going to be excited to give you money, even though they should, right. in theory. Yeah, you're going to get denied by some schools that should admit you, or you're going to not get scholarships from some schools that should give you scholarships. Flip side, you know, you might get a better offer from some school than than you may be just on the paper merit, right? It's a little bit yeah. like the, um, what do they call that in auctions? The mm. winner's, it's like the winner's curse or the winner's paradox or something like that. That in an yeah. auction, the person who buys the item, you know, you, you kind of got screwed because you necessarily, you were the one that was willing to pay more than everyone else, right? Yeah. You got like a bad deal, right? So if you apply really broadly, then one of the schools is going to give you this offer that's like out of line with the rest of them. Mm-hmm. And that's the school maybe you go to because they gave you the best, you know, they're like, holy shit, I wasn't expecting that kind of money from that school. Well, yeah. great. Then that might be the, the right one, the right one for you. But yeah, if, if, if you apply to tons of schools and there is some school that gives you a, a stipend, then yeah, you can go back to whatever school and, and see if they'll match it. It might be less ideal because it doesn't involve money, but sometimes too, I mean, the same principle applies when you apply broadly, where we hear of people who get accepted to Georgetown, but they don't get accepted to, you know, George Washington or GMU or these other schools that are lower ranked and should be accepting them. But they got into Georgetown. Yeah, or now, you get- maybe Georgetown is asking for full rate, which isn't great. But at the same time, it's like, wow, if I hadn't applied broadly, I wouldn't even be considering this option. Yeah, I've heard of people getting in, you know, getting denied by Berkeley and then the mm-hmm. same day getting a phone call that they got into Harvard. Yeah. And it's like, huh? But hey. Yeah. There's a lot of They that. liked something about you. It's everybody's making decisions based on imperfect information. And who knows what, you know, or it, it could also just be that day they were in a good mood or that day they were in a bad mood and that affected your decision. So if you apply to multiple, you know, if you apply to 20 schools, then you give yourself lots of chances for, for anomalous good stuff to happen. It's like the upside Mm -hmm. risk. That's all that matters. The downside risk doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. If you didn't think you're going to get into Harvard and you throw in an application to Harvard and you don't get in, whatever, what are you really Mm -hmm. out? A couple hundred bucks to apply. Yeah. But if you if you didn't think you would get in and you apply and you do get in, then it's like, whoa, nice <laughs> surprise. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that, you know, that couple hundred dollars may feel like a lot right now. And it is for a lot of people. But you got to step back and look at the big picture. If someone comes back and says, hey, we'll give you a $10,000 scholarship and you use that to get even just a $5,000 increase in the scholarship to a, another school you've more than, you know, what is it? Tenfold the, the money that you spent <laughs> by applying to all these schools. This next, so I, I, it's just hard. Yeah, I totally agree. This next email um, is kind of similar. This is somebody who's got multiple offers and has received seven full unconditional scholarships so far. That's great. Mm-hmm. Um, currently touring colleges to pick my top choices how do I ask for stipends without sounding ungrateful for the full scholarship? I know stipends hmm. vary depending on the college and some of my scholarships include a small amount extra to cover the mandatory fees for that specific school. But should I ask for more? How much is a normal stipend? So what do you think about the whole ungrateful idea? I, 
I don't think you're going to sound ungrateful if you're polite. I guess I, I always take the position that you can say thank you. You can say thank you for reaching out. Thank you for this generous offer. You are my top pick. I'm struggling though. Just always bring it back to a, a problem. I'm struggling because I have this other offer. Um, or, you know, I can go live with my parents in this other town and save all this money. And I'm trying to figure out how to do it. How do I do it? How do I make it work? And by putting the ball in their court and by asking them to solve the problem, you're, I don't see that as being ungrateful. You're not saying, hey, I deserve more. You're saying, I'm just struggling here. I'm trying to make a decision. I want to go to you, but here's my problem. Please help me out. And they may step up. They may not. But I, I don't think anybody's been offended by that. No. And if you consider it, if you really think about it from their perspective, I mean, it's all a big negotiation, right? And they might like mm-hmm. try to pretend that their feelings are hurt. But the truth is they're selling a super expensive product. They have to give mm-hmm. scholarships in order to keep the you know perceived value of the degree up in the marketplace. That's why they're giving you the scholarship in the first place. They're giving you money yes, because you're, you're LSAT bringing and GPA. Them, yeah. <laughs> yes. You're bringing them an LSAT and GPA number that they can then exploit for marketing their class in the future. Yeah. So you are providing a service. You should ask for every single bit you can possibly get. You should do this at your jobs too. I mean, you should just like get paid. Don't don't be grateful for what they've given you. You think about what you're bringing to them. They're employing you for a reason. You can go ahead and ask for the raise and you should just get the maximum that they're willing to pay you. Well, wait. Now, I want to clarify one thing. You said don't be grateful for what they've given you. That doesn't mean you can't say you're grateful because people are people. And if they think you're grateful, that's going to make them even more open to like. Yeah. Negotiating (laughs) is like this weird dance of being friendly, but then also, you know, trying to get the maximum value you possibly can out of the out of the arrangement. You're smiling, Mm -hmm. but you're trying to get more than your fair share of the pie or like as big of a share of the pie as you can possibly get. They're not yeah. actually giving you anything. That's the most important thing. The, the scholarship, they're giving you a chair. That's all mm-hmm. they're giving you. They're not actually giving you any money. And they're gonna, if they don't give that scholarship to you, they are going to give it to someone else because other people with your numbers won't go there for f- without that scholarship. That's why yeah. they're giving it to you. Yeah. And if, yeah, I mean, I think you can just spin it right back around to them and say, well, I have this other offer that includes a stipend. And I know what am I I, financially? I, this is really important to me. That's $10,000 a year. (laughs) Yeah. That's 30 grand. I, you're at, you know, I, will you match that offer? And they can say no, but they could also say, Oh shit, we're going to lose this applicant. If we don't match it, (laughs) let's match it. Yeah. All right. Um, that was penny. Thanks penny. Thank you. I guess we should wrap it up there. You can always join the Thinking LSAT podcast group on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Thinking LSAT. My website is strategyprep.com for classes in the D.C. area, temporarily live online. (laughs) And foxlsat.com for Nathan's classes in L.A. and San Francisco. Online. Also temporarily online. online. I mean, they're online for the time being and potentially forever. So, yeah. um, You know, it's I'm open to the possibility that we're going to decide that teaching online is just better than teaching in a live classroom anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I've for a long time, I've wondered why people commute to an LSAT class when they could just use the demon and study at home, especially for people who have, you know, a 90 minute commute to get to class. Yeah. <laughs> That's sometimes people do that. And it's like, wow, you could have studied for those 90 minutes. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited about the new world of teaching online. I am. I am as well. Our joint project is LSATdemon.com. Go there and sign up for our free seven day trial to see what we are always talking about. Uh, you can always listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, and our very own thinkinglset.com. That's also, by the way, where you can sign up for our online live class that we're doing on April 25th and 26th. Just go to thinkinglset.com, 
Uh, and then I think click on events or something like that, and you'll see the class. Uh, leave a review for us on iTunes. That always helps a ton, especially if you write something. That was episode 238 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pick the lost